Okay, my nerds, we're doing it. <laughs> I'm going to explain what Sheldon and Amy won the Nobel Prize for in the Big Bang Theory, their idea of super asymmetry. And I'm going to talk about why it's such a clever idea. It's such a clever bit of fictional science. Now, throughout the show, the writers always tried to incorporate real science. They had a lot of science consultants over the years. So Sheldon and Amy's Nobel Prize winning discovery of super asymmetry, it's entirely fictional but it's based on real scientific ideas. So things like symmetry, CP violation, and K-on experiments. And I hope that by the end of this, you're gonna see why it's such a clever way to create a story. Because you have to remember, they can't use anything that already exists. They have to present something new, but it also has to fit in some way with what we already understand about physics. They can't come up with something real that could actually win a Nobel Prize. What are these writers doing if they can win a physics Nobel Prize? Um, but today I'm going to break down for you just how real physics concepts were used to construct a fictional but plausible sounding theory that makes sense considering Sheldon's background in string theory and Amy's expertise in neuroscience. Now, recently enough as well, I've already made some like short videos about symmetry, uh, asymmetry, supersymmetry, string theory. Um, it's a lot. Some, some, some deep talk picks here. But we don't need to know them. Uh, we don't need to know too much, basically. We don't have to understand it to any like crazy level. We definitely don't need any math for this. Um, you can look back over those shorts if you want to, but I'll, I'll tell you everything you need to know in this video. And one more thing as well before we move on. If you like what I'm doing on this channel, then consider following or subscribing, liking this video. The interaction does really help me be able to continue making these videos. Um, and if you want more, you can also look at joining my channel where I make an extra video each week for my members. Uh, right now we're doing a Physics of Rick and Morty reaction series. Uh, we're covering season one. I have some regrets about that, but you know, here we are. <laughs> we're doing it. Okay, anyway. Super asymmetry. My equations have been trying to describe an imperfect world. And the only way to do that is to introduce imperfection into the underlying theory. So instead of super symmetry, it would be super asymmetry? Super asymmetry, that's it. Sheldon Cooper is a theoretical physicist. His research is focused on string theory. This is a mathematical theory that proposes that all the fundamental particles in nature are actually vibrating strings. Now, it's an attempt to unify quantum mechanics and general relativity. Amy Farr Fowler, then, is a neuroscientist. So she's interested in neurobiology and brain functions. Now, string theory deals with concepts in symmetry in nature, leading to supersymmetry and asymmetry. Neuroscience, from what I understand, which is super limited, I'm a physicist, uh, but neuroscience often deals with biological asymmetries, such as how the left and the right hemispheres of the brain specialize in different tasks. So our fictional super asymmetry theory likely takes Sheldon's physics background and Amy's expertise in asymmetry in natural systems and joins them into something new. So let's see how this all comes about. So we have to start with the concept of symmetry in physics and symmetry is a fundamental principle. It says that the laws of nature should behave the same under various transformations. So like mirror reflection, uh, time reversal, no matter where or when you are in space, they should work the same. Now, the standard model of particle physics, that's our current best model for the underlying nature of our universe, this relies on a few specific symmetries, such as charge symmetry, parity symmetry, time reversal symmetry, CPT. You may or may not have heard of this before, but I don't want you to worry about the detail too much, uh, where you don't have to get too far into it. But the complicated sounding bit, <laughs> And I've taken this straight from Wikipedia and I do not want any arguments about this because Wikipedia is a great resource if you know how to use it right. The CPT symmetry or the CPT theorem basically says that CPT symmetry holds for all physical phenomena or more precisely that any Lorentz invariant local quantum field theory with a Hermitian Hamiltonian must have CPT symmetry. What this means 
is that if our universe were a mirrored universe made up of antimatter with time reversed, it would behave exactly the same as our regular universe. However, some of these symmetries are known to be violated, leading to real world asymmetries. Now, asymmetries aren't bad. They're what allows life to exist. So let's get into the fiction of super asymmetry. Everyone's waiting. What are you guys doing? Super asymmetry. Super asymmetry? Is that a thing? We're inventing it right now. Now, super asymmetry does not exist in real physics. It is not a thing, you guys. The show invents it as a breakthrough, and they don't get into a huge amount of detail on what exactly it is, but we can kind of figure it out from what we know. Now, what we know is that symmetry leads to beautiful laws of nature that are universal and help us to understand how we move through space and time. We know that asymmetry leads to imperfect and unexpected new ways of nature creating, like, us and how we experience the world around us. We also know that the standard model of particle physics is the best model that we have at this time to put our understanding of nature to the test and to provide ways to describe it on a fundamental level. But we also know that it is incomplete and it doesn't answer everything. Now, some scientists believe that a solution is what we would call supersymmetry, which would provide an underlying symmetry to all of particle physics. So the idea in supersymmetry is that all of the particles in particle physics have a supersymmetric partner, that there's basically an entire set of particles that are the exact same as the particles that we currently have, but that they just have a different spin. So like the electron has a super particle or a super symmetric part, a uh, super partner, words. The electron would have a super partner called a selectron. The quark has a super partner called a squark. Obsessed. So that's the general idea with supersymmetry, that there's this whole other set of particles out there that we just haven't discovered yet that connect to the particles we currently know and create some sort of underlying symmetry to the entirety of the standard model. And that would kind of explain a bunch of things about why gravity is weak, why the Higgs boson exists, uh, why what the matter-antimatter uh, disparity is in physics and... Um, now, this may or may not be the case, but it is significant that we haven't discovered any of these like super partners that supersymmetry predicts in any particle experiments to date. So Sheldon and Amy's theory of super asymmetry is a solution that proposes an underlying framework for asymmetry. Basically, the claim seems to be that they have identified a fundamental reason for there to be asymmetry in nature. Now, there's a few ways we can look at this. So what they might be saying is that some particles, like the Higgs boson, are actually inherently asymmetric instead of becoming asymmetric when symmetry is broken. It could also be saying that super asymmetry is an extension of supersymmetry, suggesting that the super partners have some asymmetry to them. So instead of like a selectron, which would be the super partner of an electron, um, instead of saying that the selectron has a, uh, all the same properties as an electron, but a different spin, instead it might actually have different mass or different charge. Um, but that there's still some underlying symmetry between the super partners that will then align with super asymmetry. And this would explain why superpartners haven't been detected. Now, if asymmetry is fundamental to the universe, then it explains the questions that we have about asymmetries in physics, as well as the asymmetries in neuroscience. So it seems that the idea is that by looking at the problem in both contexts, it's what enabled them to be able to find a theory that worked for both and so resulting in an overall underlying framework in nature. Okay, <laughs> but remember, <laughs> this isn't real. These are the kinds of ideas that we can kind of throw around based on not knowing the math or like the high level physics or the high level detail. 
if these ideas were actually valid in real physics, they would be being investigated. Uh, remember, real physicists worked on this show, specifically um, a guy called David Salzberg. He science consulted all the way through the Big Bang Theory. His work is in high energy particle physics. Um, so yeah, I'm just trying to, just keeping us grounded in reality. Okay, so, so it's a loose idea of a theory. It's got some logical threads to it. It's not too fictional to be totally crazy, but it's not too real to like step on any actual work that's being done in physics. As in, it's, it's not um, taking any current ideas and claiming that they've solved them or come up with a solution to them. But a Nobel Prize is never awarded simply for an idea or a mathematical proof. It has to have evidence, real physical evidence from an experiment. And this is where Pemberton, Campbell and their k experiments at Fermilab come into the story. This whole thing is actually a gigantic accident. Yeah, we've been working with k and our data made absolutely no sense. A few weeks ago, someone told us about your paper and we realized that our failed experiment confirmed your theory. Now, one of the symmetry violations that you might hear about or have heard about is called CP violation, so charge parity violation. We don't need to get too much into detail, just know that it connects to how nature treats matter and antimatter differently. Kaons are subatomic particles that exist in two types. There's neutral kaons and there's charged kaons. The neutral kaons can oscillate between their matter and antimatter states. Now, in 1964, K-On experiments by two physicists, James Cronin and Val Fitch, gave the first clear evidence that CP symmetry could be broken, meaning that K-Ons and anti kaons don't behave identically under charge parity transformations. Now, they won a Nobel Prize in 1980 for this work. So in the show, when the Fermilab scientists show up, they say that their experiments on k particle decay supports the predictions Sheldon and Amy made on the higher order corrections. So, <laughs> higher order corrections. This, here we're referring to small, subtle adjustments in theoretical predictions. We generally will start with a simple level of calculation when we're looking at something, and then you build on it. So when you go, when you go beyond that simple level uh, in quantum field theory, higher order corrections will start to come up. And because we're talking about k on decay, we can think about it in terms of decay rates in particle physics. And these decays and their interactions, they're not based on just one single calculation. They are a summing up of many quantum effects. So in this context, saying a higher order correction could be referring to small effects that may have been ignored or seen as not like contributing previously, which then leads us to an idea that super asymmetry by Sheldon and Amy made a prediction about the role of small effects in k on decay that then gets confirmed by the k on decay experiments at Fermilab. Okay, like in reality, it would still take a long time to verify the results of both the theory and the experiment before any Nobel Prize was awarded. But Higgs and Englert got the Nobel Prize in 2013, which was just one year after the Higgs boson was discovered. So it can be quick when established theory is proven using experiment. So let's bring this all to an end. Super asymmetry, not a real theory. German paper in the show, not a real paper. But the fictional idea? very cleverly put together. It basically is building on real symmetry breaking discoveries, so CP violation. It's using k particles which have historical significance in discovering asymmetries. It connects Sheldon's background in physics and Amy's expertise in biological asymmetry in a plausible way. And it mirrors real world physics history, so thinking about things like Nobel Prize winning discoveries stemming from experimental results confirming theoretical predictions. So to summarize what I think super asymmetry is, we know that there is symmetry in nature. We know that it is important to us. We also know that there are asymmetries, which are also important to us. Some of the asymmetries, we don't really have a good answer for. So the Higgs boson comes from a broken symmetry. Uh, antimatter and matter not being in equal amounts in the universe is an asymmetry that we don't know the cause of. What it seems to me is that they're basically saying 
that let's look at these kaon particles, let's look at these neutral kaon particles that have this fluctuation between their, um, their matter-antimatter states. And then let's expand that into this idea around there being some higher order corrections that maybe previously haven't seemed to be important, but maybe Sheldon and Amy with their combined expertise have found some way to recognize the importance of some of these higher order corrections and to apply that to the kaon decay in such a way that leads them to a proposal that rather than the Higgs boson arising from a broken symmetry or rather than there being uh, some some unknown uh, random process that that leads to matter antimatter miss uh, um, miss miss mis oh my god why can't I think matter antimatter different levels of matter antimatter in the universe God I feel like my brain just broke for a second um, so matter antimatter being in different levels or different amounts in the universe. Also, like the, our question as to why gravity is such a weak force in comparison to the other fundamental forces, that their kind of idea comes around at the end to say that there is some fundamental asymmetry in nature. We don't know what that fundamental asymmetry would be because it's not real, <laughs> but it's basically saying, okay, well, there is a fundamental asymmetry. Um, the Higgs is... Uh, asymmetric because it fundamentally is not because symmetry is broken that matter antimatter is asymmetric because of this same fundamental thing the brain is asymmetric because of the same fundamental thing within the entirety of nature and our understanding of it um so yeah that's that's kind of where where it is N not real but based in some really really cool ideas in physics and it's just something that I just really, I love it so much because putting fictional science into a show like this is really tricky. It's not science fiction. Like you can't just make things fantastical. You can't bring things completely out of the box. The show itself is set current day. It's real world physics. So while it doesn't have to be real science, it does have to make sense and it does have to fit into what we know of the world and the characters up to this point and I just think it is beautifully done. And not easy topics to talk about which is probably why I have chickened out of doing it until now and I'm really sorry if any of that was messy or confusing or a bit ooh. Uh, yeah it's it, it it's it's tricky to give the context of, of what I think is needed. Uh, maybe I went into too much detail, maybe I didn't go into enough detail. I'm not sure. You guys can let me know what you think. But I I feel I feel like I understand it better. I feel like the whole time I've always been like, I wonder what their what their Nobel Prize was supposed to be for. And now I feel like, okay, cool. I, yeah, that I'm I'm with it. I'm with it. So I hope you enjoyed this. Um I hope that you're as impressed with it as I am. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate it when you guys watch these videos. Um, I really appreciate it when you leave comments as well. Um, also letting me know like any other shows or movies or books or like just bits of science that you want to know about. Uh, also, like I said, please consider subscribing if you want more. Um, I really appreciate it and stay nerdy. Bye. Can you believe it? <gasps> That's a good point. What if I'm dreaming? I'm the new